Uh, good evening, everyone. We're back in session uh, for the June 20th, 2018 meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. Uh, we will now uh, have general public comments. Anyone wishing to make a comment? Three minutes. Please approach the podium. We'll put an end to general public comment. Minutes of June 6, 2018, regular Town Council meeting. May I have a motion? Move approved. Second. Uh, any adjustments or amendments? Uh, seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Adjustments to the agenda? Uh, none at this time. Items to be signed. Treasurer's warrants are to be signed, which I will do at the conclusion of the meeting. Uh, order 18 41, 7 p.m. public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 601, the Traffic Ordinance Section 25A1 to eliminate year-round parking along a portion of Black Point Road. And I would ask Sergeant O'Malley uh, to present this for us. say that first this uh, issue was called to our attention uh, via the uh, proprietor of the state park, if you would. Uh, Keep talking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mike. Uh, and essentially, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a huge uh, impact uh, by measurement. Five parking spaces. Uh, it was called to our attention by um, Greg Wilford, who manages the state park, uh, that it was a safety issue for his patrons uh, coming and going uh, across the crosswalk that is there to the overflow parking. Um, he asked originally for a, quite an extensive uh, no parking area, and uh, we whittled it down to just line of sight. Uh, the reason we looked at it as uh, 50 feet to the right out the entrance uh, and 50 feet to the left out the exit, uh, which is essentially the minimum length of a parking space is 20 to 25 feet. We went two car lengths either way. Uh, towards the southernmost uh, entrance uh, facing Prouts, there was, there's a crosswalk there, so we lost one parking spot because you can't park in a park crosswalk anyway. Uh, and the other one, we'd lose two parking spots. Uh, it's essentially uh, just for that reason, for the safety issue of his patrons. Uh, visibility, line of sight for cars leaving, <coughs> cars pulling in, and for pedestrians crossing uh, to the overflow parking area. Thank you. Questions from the town council? Councilor Kennedy. Yeah, Sergeant O'Malley, I know you and I have talked about this. Um, and I know that the police have posted uh, temporarily that there's no parking there, you know, pursuant to us looking at this as an issue. Have you heard any complaints from anyone uh, regarding it being posted or had issues with people parking where you guys have posted it? It, it was, uh, ironically, it was, it had always been posted in error that there was no parking and yeah. there was a tow-away zone right. down there. Uh, and uh, when we realized that it was posted, uh, there were some, some parking ticket issues Right. parking tickets issued and those generated some complaints <laughs> but <laughs> but since then since you guys uh, went since, down and did since we since we did an emergency posting uh, we haven't had any complaints okay thank you to my knowledge w when was it that you uh, posted uh, that would have been this spring uh, we we took down the inappropriate signs and po and then reposted appropriate signs and uh, that was Give me two seconds. Winter. I think it was probably March. Yeah, it was March, March, of this year. March, April, March. and then you get to May 15th, and there's no parking there. Period. Anyway. Anywhere. Um, on either no, side. that that actually in 1994 we exempted uh, that portion 
of, of yes, so May, no parking, May 1st right. to September 1st right. in that portion. That was exempted from the no parking at all uh, back in 1994. That was exempted? So, oh. so there is no parking from May 1st to September 1st in that particular area. Every place else there is no parking at all. Right. Okay. Councilor Rowley. Yeah, we, we had a conversation at First Street, I believe, about uh, whether the intent was for both sides of the streets or just the side that, that the parking lot is. Do you have an opinion on which was appropriate? Uh, I think between Director Shar and I from Public Works, we felt that it was for the purpose stated, it was just that one side that was appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, just a couple of follow-up questions. I know <clears throat> when we talked about this earlier, I, I have not received a single email from any constituent about a safety issue or concern about safety. Two, I understand there was a request made by a individual, but and then thirdly, really kind of a follow-up to, to Council Katarina's question. I know recently the police have posted on their Facebook page um, for citizens to say where they think the most dangerous area is or where there's safety issues in Scarborough. Now, I've read a lot of those, and a lot of them are the major intersections here. There's lots of conversations about excess speed in a lot of places. Did anybody mention this, the parking down there in those spots as being an issue? Did it float up to being, did anybody make any comment about a safety issue or a concern about safety? I'm afraid at I don't. Beach? I'm afraid I don't have an answer to that, Councilor Hayes. Uh, I, I'm not uh, privy to that information as it comes in unless it comes across directed at me. So I don't is that, is that something we could get, though? I'm, I'm certain if it exists, sure. I can find it. Because, I mean, I, it, was, it was a pretty, it was really well done. So anybody, you know, let us know where you are concerned in Scarborough about safety issues. And I'd be concerned. And then the third request would be to Councillor Katarina. I think when we, at first read, you said you had gotten several or right. numerous emails. Right. And I made a request that you kind of share them with the rest of us so we can see them. I haven't, oh, I haven't seen them, so I, I, I you were, I thought you said you were concerned that I hadn't shared them at the time. So. Well, no, I just, I, you know, for us to be, I'd just like to, whatever you got, mm -hmm. share them with us. So I haven't seen any, anything, for, and actually I've gotten emails from a dozen or so, half a dozen or so, saying they are concerned about additional restrictions, so. Yeah, and the emails that I, I received in <clears> review, and I'll dig them out, is, um, had to do as much with the, the ticketing that was going on because of the posting and confusion about was and wasn't there. And I know there have been questions about it in the past, and that's why I asked if the police and, and public works would go down and say, is this something that should be addressed? So this is why we're here where we're at. And frankly, you know, in my opinion, you know, taking away a couple of parking spots right there along the, the, uh, the road to me is. I would say I support it, but there you go. And just a follow-up question. Uh, how would you enforce this? I mean, some of the ordinances we've passed, some of the parking ordinances have created some issues for us for enforcement. Is it, how would you envision enforcing? It's a sign. Uh, it, it would be in, on an as-needed basis and, uh, and through the course of normal patrol. I think probably uh, driving that roadway, Peter Nappy, is in that vehicle, police vehicle and patrolling all the time. So I but they're, I, they're paid for by Pelts Mac, right? Is that who you're referring to? Would he, would he patrol this? He this absolutely thing? patrols that, that section. Uh, because the 25 mile an hour speed limit that is so important to that neighborhood uh, starts before you get to the bend in the road where the art building uh, is it's it's before you get to the entrance to uh, the state park by a few hundred feet. Chris, um, so Sergeant O'Malley, just for my clarification, I, I I heard you say that the one individual who we got the complaint from is actually the manager of the facility. Correct. So it's not a it, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not a, a local resident who happens to be living nearby that is not comfortable with that. It's the actual person in charge of that facility. Is that fair? Um, to clarify, he's the one that asked for it. Yes. He, yeah, he, he was, yes. But his position is manager of that facility. He's yes. not a citizen who lives nearby who's... I'm not sure where he lives, but he does, okay. he is the manager of that facility. And yes. he made that request in that position as... Correct. Okay. Um, 
I, I think one of the things we struggle with is this, this you know, to, maybe to Councillor Hayes' point, it seems like it's new to us, but could, we're not privy to all of the uh, input that, that you all get from public safety. Um, is it, would you say that this is a relatively new occurrence or this is something that's been happening over time and it's gotten to the point where now we're in a situation where it needs to be addressed? In my opinion, uh, the patronage of that park has been growing substantially uh, year by year. And uh, we are in a position where daily we have traffic issues in that particular area on a nice sunny day where we back up into the roadway. Uh, so anything we can do to make it safer uh, in that particular area before we have a tragedy may be to our benefit. Good. Thank you. Are, are there standards for setbacks from uh, public commercial business driveways? No. <laughs> so, I mean, it makes sense, it seems to me, to have some setback. I just didn't know if Scarborough has any. We, we have setbacks from fire hydrants, we have setbacks from intersections, um, but we don't have an ordinance setback from a private driveway. Okay. Um, don't say. So, in the summertime, I, I definitely see it, as you said, increased traffic use in, and uh, increase in potential for accidents. So I'm curious if we've had some major incidents down there, and then would you do you have the same opinion of the winter months? Uh, I'm not aware of any near misses, if you will, in the winter months, uh, and I know that is a, a frequenting uh, place for some winter surfers. Um, and I think that's why we try to limit it to such a small portion, uh, essentially five parking spots, um, that seem to fall uh, within an acceptable range. That's what Thank you. Uh, I, I, I just want to comment on the standard setback piece. Um, it, I, I believe from the Transportation Committee, we're typically looking at line of sight. As a, as a mechanism. Is that a fair mechanism to say when you're looking from a safety perspective? It's not a, a set distance. It's sitting, you have to actually be physically at the intersection, look at what line of sights look like, what the safe, you know, and, and assume the safe distance is based on the actual setting. Is that, is that fair? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, would you say that we're talking about 50 feet on each side of the entrance and the exit? Uh, is there any distance shorter than 50 feet? Or is that the minimum that you consider necessary to achieve the goal here of significantly improved line of sight? I think we could drop back uh, a few feet, but I think uh, we aren't gaining much. Uh, we need 25 feet at a minimum to put in a parking spot. Um, so if, if we halved it by, by that, then we, that's the only way we would gain anything. And in fact, on the southernmost uh, driveway, there's a crosswalk there, so we have to start beyond that anyway. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't gain anything of, of uh, appreciable amount there. On the northern side, uh, we would still have one parking spot there. Good. Other questions of Sergeant O'Malley? Great. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, this is the public hearing. We have gone through first reading. We will have a subsequent hearing uh, for second reading. Uh, uh, so I am now going to open up uh, the proceeding to conduct the public hearing. Anyone wishing to address the town council on this matter, please approach the podium. Yes, Laurie Bruns, 39 Hanson Road. And I have a question. I'm confused as, as to when you can actually park in this area. You, can, you, can you park there in the summertime? Can you park there in the wintertime? I thought I heard him say that that road is closed all the rest of the time, for parking on both sides of the road. When can you park at that, in that, on that road, and where on that road can you park? I think both sides of Black Point Road uh, have a restriction that says no parking from May to September 15th to September 15th or 1st. I'm not sure which. Okay, so but, you can park there in the winter time. But mm -hmm. yes, the, you can. So that from September through until mid-May, I know it's May 15th, uh, you, you can park there. And there's a certain number of spaces right in front of the parking lot that are exempted from that ordinance. And there's no, there are there? no spaces marked 
it's just like most of our streets. You can pull off onto the gravel portion of the edge of the roadway, which is what people do yeah. at the present time. But it's only a certain section. It's not doesn't go on forever. It's, mm -hmm. it's like 300 feet one side of the park or 300 feet the other side of the park. Or uh, it's uh, there's a extensive straightaway uh, heading away from Prout's Neck. And uh, so there'd be an, a relatively unlimited amount of parking opportunity. If I, you want if to I try may, to answer the question? Yeah, Mr. Bruns, um, what they're looking for is just, um, there's, the Scarborough Beach has an entrance there, and, it, and it it's used year round. I, 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 and all, all we would be doing is saying no parking for a couple of more car lengths beyond that in the winter time. Otherwise, there's no parking there anyway. In summer, there's no parking on the road there. And what I'm, what I'm saying is, is you're saying there is parking there in the summertime. Except no. For the, no. Except the, no. So oh, you no, cannot no. park there at all in the summertime. That's correct. Park. Correct. It's only the off season okay. when you can park there. Okay. So that's what this would be applicable to, mm -hmm. because in season parking is already banned <clears throat> in total okay. throughout okay. that entire stretch. Okay. So that explains that. Okay. Um, some things that I hope. First of all, was this brought forth by the Ordinance Committee or was this brought forth by the gentleman who owns the property straight to the Town Council? It came through so. Ordinance. Okay. Um, some things I that I uh, had thought of, is, uh, basically, I really hate giving up a right that I already have and just having that terminated and all of a sudden it becomes a privilege, which I really don't care for. Um, uh, does, the, does the town have the ability to actually widen the road there and put in official parking spaces so that people don't have to? Uh, in, in, and I'm talking about off-season now because in the, in the wintertime, it can be a bit of a trick getting past those cars. I don't think that's been entertained. I, I, yeah. Okay. Just a seed of thought. Uh, the other possibilities, uh, the sanitary district owns land across the street. And is there any reason that we couldn't put a parking lot over there to facilitate parking or additional parking to Scarborough Beach in the summertime? Again, um, I, don't, I don't think it's good that you make a suggestion because we certainly could consider it. The, uh, uh, I'm just, I'm, you're taking privilege away from me. Yeah, the I'd like something in return. Right. The sanitary district property has a roadway that leads to their property, which is to the rear yeah. of the frontage on Black Point Road. So the frontage on Black Point Road, I think, is pretty much occupied by residential homeowners. Yeah, the, 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 if you believe the GIS maps that the town has of that area, we have an open space 30 feet wide on either side of the road leading to the sanitary district. That's it, that's accurate. But beyond the first house lot that's there, there's an area in back of that that, that would facilitate approximately 100 cars of parking. Another option would be is the land that abuts the sanitary district on the Route one side of the Black Point Road, if you want to call it that, or would that be northerly side, is owned by the Sprague Corporation. It yeah, I, I think there is auxiliary parking on the uh, side away from the entrance at just the present giving, time. Just giving you more options, but Thank these you. are these are options that we don't have right now. The auxiliary parking, um, it says in the park rules that um, parking in the main lot is not available in the winter months. It's only available during on-season months. Well, that would say to me that parking in the auxiliary parking lot may be available, and has that ever been explored as an opportunity for Scarborough residents to be able to park there mm -hmm. and allow us to enjoy that beach yeah. without endangering our lives on a slippery road? Yeah, we, we don't, I don't think the town council is aware of whether that's true or not. Okay. I, I, that's, thank you very much for your time. and Thank you for your questions. Some follow-up. Marvin Gates, my wife and I, Debbie, live at 423 Black Point Road, which is across the street uh, from the Scarborough Beach State Park. Uh, we are in that building that I think, Mr. Donovan, you uh, mentioned, the art building, uh, residential building. I walk uh, our dog at the state park just about every day of the winter. And uh, I've had one instance that I wanted to bring up where the parking 
literally block the entrance to mm -hmm. the state park. You, you, can, you can get by a car and you can get in there. Uh, nothing terribly dramatic, but it, that sort of thing uh, really shouldn't happen. So, and I pasted off this morning the 50 feet. It's not that much. Uh, our concern would be if you lengthened the amount of space uh, where you couldn't park, we would be concerned that it would inch it, the parking would inch its way down towards Prozac. We're right before the turn there. And uh, that's not a dangerous corner, but if there's parking on that corner, people come around from Prozac and don't really see the parking going on. It's a little bit of a blind corner, but the 50 feet that the officer described seemed fine to us. Uh, and appreciate your attention to it. Uh, I would be in favor of it, we would be in favor of it, uh, but no more than the 50 feet that would be possible. Thanks. Wait, Mr. Chair, if I could, can I yes. ask do something a little maybe unprecedented here? Yes, I, you may. <laughs> Mr. Gates, may I ask a question, if you don't mind? Sure, of course. Um, being uh, the location is uh, strikes me as a very good opportunity to ask you, in the winter months, um, what is, w do you see a lot of parking there? Is it, is it uh, 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 how would you describe the number of cars that are typically there? Uh, on, a, uh, on a cloudy, cold winter day, I would say, uh, the chances are very close to being some, something like zero. Uh, on a beautiful, sunny winter day, uh, I would say maybe it could stretch up to a dozen. Okay. Uh, you're not talking about more than that. I can't remember more than that. Uh, Okay. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you, and thank you for opening Harmon's Market. <laughs> it's a very nice gallery. Uh, Chief Bolton. I just wanted to clarify that the, the real issue here is from about March or so mm. until May 1st, because what happens is, is that the, um, when they have nice days and they open the park, before May 1st, then there are cars that park in there. And that's where the real issue is with people using the park and coming out when cars are parked right close to the, uh, close to the edge of the driveway. Thank you. So I, uh, what the Chief's saying but, is but that I would, but uh, I it's only that. when the, the, the line of sight issue only arises when there are cars in the parking lot of the state park. Yeah, the only, the only um, thing that I would say to that is the reason that we were looking to bring something year-round for those spots is that we really didn't want to introduce something that has now a different date right. than some of our mm -hmm. other dates. It's already confusing for our folks as to when they can, when they can't, yeah. and so forth. So just having an additional date of March 1st or whatever mm -hmm. seemed like it was going to create an issue. That's why we were looking at year-round. Chris. So, Chief, I know this is beyond your purview, but um, I guess maybe a question I would ask, and it kind of relates to Mr. Bruns's question before. Uh, is there a way to ask the state park, if they're going to open, to plow the auxiliary lot or whatever it is to give people the opportunity to park in this so they're not parking on the street? Is that an approach we could possibly take, or is that beyond our jurisdiction and we can't ask that or request that? I have not had discussions, but we okay. certainly could. Okay. It's an interesting idea mm -hmm. is to collaborate with the state park if we have plows up there. Thank I, you. I think part of the issue is, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Sergeant, but part of the issue is when they do open, they're charging. So I'm not right. sure that they're going to want right. to allow cars to other cars to park in there that aren't paying their fee. Yeah, that's true. Council vote. I just want to ask a clarifying question because I think I'm getting confused. So Mr. Wolfert manages the state park? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So he made the request. So yes. it would seem that if, if he started the manager. conversation, maybe he would be the one to follow up with, you know, Councilor Chiazzo's suggestion. I, I think that would be mm -hmm. a win-win for everybody um, to have a little bit more parking down there and get them off the street. Just yeah. a thought. Well, worth exploring. Thank you, Chief. 
Others who would like to speak to this issue? Just a point of clarification <laughs> Thank you for allowing. Um, the auxiliary parking lot is owned by a private landowner. So I don't know why we couldn't enter into that agreement with a private landowner ourselves. I don't think we have to go mm -hmm. through the parks to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the next observation I had, it sounds like part of the problem with uh, line of sight in vehicles is when they are trying to use the auxiliary parking lot, turning traffic around, getting them out of their parking lot again and over to the auxiliary lot. So perhaps there needs to be some management, traffic management considered by the parks department as well. Thank you. Others? Hi, my name is Ryan McDermott. I'm one of the owners of Black Point Surf Shop, uh, 134 Black Point Road. And uh, I just want to, I surf every day I can at Scarborough Beach. I have been for 15 years now and I just want to make sure that in the off season when the park is closed that there will be ample parking for us to still access the beach there. That's really the most important thing to me uh, just because there's not that many places you can go in the winter where you're away from everybody and that's one that we have that we should keep. And if we, I'm just afraid if we extend the parking, I mean, 50 feet towards the Prout's neck side seems a little long because if you're coming out of Scarborough Beach, looking that way, you have the entire entering lane to look at. But in my understanding, there's parking, unlimited parking on Black Point Road in either direction, if that's right. Um, and if that is the case, then it shouldn't matter if it's 50 feet or 20 feet or whatever. Um, I just want to make sure that that is the case that there is, you know, parking for up to, you know, 40 cars. Mm -hmm. I, I know on the right winter day, there could be <laughs> up to 20 people down there and uh, it would just, you know, be too bad if we lost that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Others? Close the public hearing, thank you. Uh, order 1844, 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license, special amusement license, and a liquor license from Jenner's for Siegler, DBA 21 Taps, LLC, located at 185 U.S. Route 1, and I asked the town clerk to report on this. Uh, this is a change in ownership. They have actually purchased uh, where Dimitri's and Pizza Time have been located. Uh, we followed the um, requirements of the special amusement license and sent out notices to all the abutters. We received nothing back. Um, as soon this license would be issued, or the licenses would be issued once they received their occupancy permit from the code office. Thank you. Anyone uh, wishing to address this matter, please approach the podium. I accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion? None. Two, mm -hmm. none. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous, thank you. Uh, old business, uh, order 18-30, second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 405, uh, the zoning ordinance of the town of Scarborough, Maine, section Roman numeral six, definitions in section Roman numeral 17B, Haggis Parkway District, HP, B, permitted uses, conventional and planned developments. And I think uh, Mr. Chase, the planning director, will introduce this matter for us. Sure, happy to do so. Thank you very much. Um, as I've presented this before you twice before, I'll keep it pretty brief for those who <laughs> haven't been privy to that. Um, just by way of background, as you noted, these are proposed changes to the zoning ordinance. Um, principally, it's around the issue of really um, uh, bringing the Haggis Parkway District into alignment with the way we treat other uh, businesses and other uh, business districts around accessory storage of materials uh, for um, things that are produced uh, on site. Uh, currently in the Haggis Parkway District, as I just said, um, there's a, a little more prescriptive terms and uh, term and, uh, regarding how much of that uh, accessory storage of goods and materials can be maintained on a site. And so this provision would really, as I said, serve to clarify that by eliminating a, one of the stated permitted activities in the Haggis Parkway 
but then we go on to make other refinements in the zoning ordinance around definitions, uh, clarifications around distribution facilities and warehousing facilities that we think will bring things more in line uh, with, uh, with uh, expectations. So uh, happy to. Questions for Mr. Chase. Thank you, Jay. Yes. Uh, Mr. Could I just get uh, a little bit of clarification? So we are removing uh, the um, clause in, in permitted uses for the Haggis Parkway where we even talk about warehouse and distribution at all. And, and therefore, it's not an allowed use because it's not mentioned um, unless it you know, is an auxiliary use for, for what you said. Correct. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, Jay, the, uh, we had. To, would you address the Long Range Planning Committee's uh, uh, amendments? There were some minor amendments, as I recall. From sure. Yep. First um, reading. And, and so, right, and I presented those at public hearing um, at, uh, at the initial first reading. Um, this item went. There were a number of questions by counselors, um, and those questions were really echoed uh, when we did the planning board public hearing. So at that point, uh, staff, I worked with Karen Martin at Seco. We asked council to pause for a moment to um, basically skip a meeting for second reading so we could take it back to Long Range Planning Committee to talk through those elements. And so that's where we made some further refinements to the definitions of distribution and warehousing. Um, and those were presented in a uh, uh, memorandum that uh, was dated June 1st and presented to council at, public, uh, at the public hearing on this item. Good. So uh, procedurally, we need to have a motion to amend to add those uh, uh, before we uh, address the main motion. Good. Thank you. Public hearing. Uh, anyone wishing to address this uh, matter, please approach the podium. Seeing none, uh, accept the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, uh, discussion? I'll recognize... Uh, Councillor Katerina for a motion to amend. What am I amending? <laughs> I'm sorry. Is it this, is it highlighted. this highlighted stuff? Okay. Um, gosh, all right. Be it hereby ordained by the Town Council, the Town of Scarborough, Maine, and Town Council assembled at Chapter 405 of the Zoning Ordinance of the Town of Scarborough, Maine, Section 6 definitions is amended as follows Distribution facility, a structure or building used to strike primarily for the receiving and shipping, strike receiving and storing of finished, uh, back to original, of finished goods and articles where goods are received, uh, strike and or stored for and, and then add and redirected for delivery to the ultimate customer at remote locations. <laughs> Warehousing facility, strike and storage, a strike, or, excuse me, a structure Chamber, building. I think yeah. we, if you make reference to uh, the materials that were provided in the agenda packet, I think that probably would suffice. Oh, okay. So just say that for identification purposes. To the extent that that satisfies council's interest in what the motion is. Yes. So. I think that's satisfactory. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I'll second the, the second the motion. <laughs> Seconded by Councilor Rowan. Uh, Discussion on the motion to amend. Um, Councilor Gatorine. Having been on long range planning, I know this has been thoroughly vetted and looked at and talked about and whatever, so I obviously would support this. Other comments? Uh, seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Uh, we now have a main motion as amended. Uh, uh, discussion. Further discussion on it. Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Opposed? It is adopted. Thank you. A little awkward, but we made it. <laughs> uh, boo, 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 boo. New business, order 18-45, uh, uh, first reading on the proposed sec uh, second amendment to contract zone Roman numeral three, Main Life Care Retirement Community, Inc., located at 5 Dorado Drive, and I would uh, uh, recognize uh, Jim Adamovich and, and his crew of folks from Piper Shores to make a presentation to introduce this matter. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. I'm Jim Adamovich. I'm CEO of Maine Life Care Retirement Community, doing business as Piper Shores. We are here tonight to support our application to modify an existing contract zoning agreement in order to expand our 501c3 continuing care retirement community on a close by parcel. Joining me this evening to support our presentation before council is Will Conway of Sebago Technics. Uh, Will represents our civil engineering partner. Eric Dale and SK Advisors is our pre-construction development consultant. We also have present Ron Epstein, legal counsel from Jensen Baird, and we have another, another, a number of members of the Piper Shores leadership team uh, present this evening. Piper Shores would like to expand its current offerings by acquiring and constructing additional independent living housing on the nearby property of 5 Dorado Drive. Piper Shores current property consists of 138 acres at 15 Piper Road. The community is effectively built out on this site as 96 of the 138 acres at the 15 Piper Road address are conserved. The organization has a wait list of nearly 160 parties who would like to move to Piper Shores. That number constitutes an existing wait list of a, pro a wait period of approximately three to seven years. Piper Shores has entered into a purchase and sale agreement to acquire the property at 5 Dorado Drive. That property is a 45 acre property that contains a single family home and a detached barn. The property is within 150 feet of the front entrance to 15 Piper Road. We would like to share the following with council this evening for your consideration. We'd like to provide you with a brief overview of the proposed development. We'd like to share some of the key aspects of the proposed contract zone amendment that we're uh, putting forward for your consideration. We'd also like to briefly share with you some feedback uh, from a recent meeting with property owners that abut the 5 Dorado Drive property and also share with you briefly from our perspective a number of community benefits that we believe that this project uh, will entail. We appreciate the opportunity to present our plans before council this evening and I would like to ask Will Conway of Sebago Technics to lead us through the development initiative. Will? Thank you, members of the council. Uh, I'm Will Connolly. I'm a landscape architect with Sebago Technics. And uh, what I'm going to show you tonight is what I think is a, one of the most exciting uh, projects that our firm has been uh, associated with. The um, proposed plan that you'll see more is composed of three housing types. And I'm going to introduce some new terms. Uh, to you this evening. Uh, there's um, 16 single family cottages, 16 uh, residences in a pocket neighborhood, and I'll explain a pocket neighborhood to you a little bit further along uh, in the discussion. Uh, and then 24 to 28 units in a hybrid apartment building that also has a clubhouse that will serve uh, this site as well as uh, complement the existing Piper Shores community. Um, this um, aerial photograph uh, here shows the existing Piper Shores campus. My cursor is really not showing up very well. Um, and anyway, this is Spurwink Road here, and then this is the Dorado property here. Um, there's about 150 feet distance uh, on Spurwink between the two properties. This is an aerial photograph of the site, um, and uh, Spurwink Road is on the left here. Well, I think your pointer will only work on the screen, not on the... Oh, okay, great. Okay. Oh, this is much better. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Again, 
again, the photo's kind of dark, but so this is Spurwink Road and the property kind of dog legs uh, like this. And you'll see in other uh, diagrams, right here is a ridge line that's about 25 feet taller than Spurwink Road. So this area of the site is not visible from the public right of way. And it is spectacular. The landowner uh, maintains this as a mowed area. And you'll see that we've retained that as a central element of the site plan. This is an existing conditions plan of the property. Uh, it shows uh, sort of the areas that are wooded. This is the, um, Jim mentioned, the existing single family home, which is located here. This is the driveway that comes in, crests the hill here, drops down, and then climbs back up to the residence here. So this is open area, uh, and then these are, are more wooded sites on the property. Uh, Sebago's wetland scientists have been on the site uh, and mapped the wetlands. They're predominantly sort of in this area of the site. There's a little bit here and a little bit here, uh, but there's a large wetland complex uh, right there. And Jim and I have met with the main DEP with our preliminary development plan, uh, and they've encouraged us, and it's certainly uh, Piper's uh, mission to be good stewards of the environment and minimize the wetland impacts associated with the project. This is the exciting part. This is the development plan uh, that we're proposing. And um, under the current zoning regulations, um, the front setbacks for building are 50 feet, and the, the side and rear setbacks are 15 feet. And one of the community benefits is we're proposing substantial increases to those. On the Spurwink uh, frontage, we're proposing a 200-foot setback. Uh, and then on the sides of the property, uh, we're proposing a 50-foot uh, uh, either undisturbed buffer or a vegetative buffer. I mentioned this beautiful area here in the, in the center, the existing mode area. That's going to be retained. And in it, at the low point, will be a stormwater pond with a permanent water pool elevation. And then the three neighborhoods are sort of um, clustered around this open space. This is the pocket neighborhood here. This is the hybrid apartments here, and then the cottages are here. One of the elements of the plan uh, that's very important is the series of trails that are back uh, in this area. They uh, connect to and go on to the Camp Ketcha property, and also to the Scarborough Land Trust, which is sort of a little bit off the screen. Um, our plan is to preserve those trails and to provide public access to them. So any resident of Scarborough could drive into the access road to a small trailhead uh, in this location and then access those trails. This is the pocket neighborhood. And what a pocket neighborhood is, is it's a neighborhood that um, turns the traditional development pattern inside out. And so what that means is all of the access to the project, to the buildings, occurs on the perimeter. These would be access to garages. These units would come in here to the garages. So the front doors of these buildings are here, 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 and here, 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 and here. And they all open onto a common green space. So it encourages social interaction. And it's a very unique housing style. There's nothing like this in Maine uh, today. And we think it's really a great plan. These two uh, pockets uh, are contiguous with the grand open space uh, that I presented earlier that has the pond in it. So it's really kind of a, uh, a very walkable, outdoor-oriented kind of environment. These are the cottage units, and similar to those, the access is on the perimeter. Again, the front doors would be in this zone and in this zone, uh, encouraging, uh, again, interaction between the residents. 
I mentioned the trailhead for public access. That would occur here, and it would be adjacent to, we're envisioning, envision, envisioning a modern, uh, a modest, excuse me, maintenance barn uh, that would uh, provide maintenance for the entire site. And lastly is the proposed hybrid building. Whoops. Thank you. So the, as I mentioned, uh, there's a central feature of Clubhouse. This is um, not completely thought out yet, but it would be a, uh, like a pub or a bistro kind of thing, probably would serve lunch and dinner. Um, would have fitness rooms on um, a different level. And then there would be two units, two wings of units on either side. And this would be a three-story building that would be, have parking under it. Uh, so you would drive here under the building and then you could take an elevator up to it. And then this area here would be for uh, people that don't live in this complex that want to come and take advantage of this amenity. That amenity would have served this property as well as uh, people uh, in the current Piper Shores campus could come over and enjoy a meal in this location. This is a view um, that it's a little bit uh, tough to read, but it's, this is Spurwink Road here. This is the hybrid apartment building here. And there's a, a view line that, again, I mentioned that crest uh, 25 feet above the elevation. And your view from here would go over the roof of that building. So that building would not be visible uh, from Spurling. And this is a, a, the arrows will show you a viewpoint um, coming up the access road. You would see a little bit of the roof lines of the um, the uh, pocket neighborhood, and just barely a, a glimpse uh, of the uh, very top of the roof of the hybrid building. Uh, Jim, in his opening, asked uh, me to explain sort of what the elements of the Second Amendment are, and I'll just go through those. So um, it's to basically use the existing contract zone and amend it. One of the amendments is to um, allow a maximum building height of 55 feet, which is for that one hybrid building, basically a, a level of parking and then three levels above it with pitched roofs. Um, I met with Jay Chase and the code enforcement officer in terms of how you measure that building. Um, and so we derived a, a height of uh, 55 feet for it. Uh, currently, your ordinance has a maximum road length of 2,000 feet. We're asking for uh, the ability to um, extend that to 2,900 feet to allow us to possibly in the future uh, develop the rear portion of the property. And then the density that we're asking for is 61. And the plans that I showed you are 48 to 52, which is what we envisioned to build in the first phase. Uh, so we would like the provision to add a few more in the future in the rear of the property. And in that event, um, you know, certainly we, we would be subject to the, the, uh, all of the requirements of planning board review, et cetera. But we would like to have that um, accomplished in this phase of the amendment. Um, in terms of ben benefits to the public, I remember I, um, I mentioned the increased setbacks, preservation of the views along Spurwink Road, uh, providing a unique, innovative housing project that currently doesn't exist in Scarborough, uh, the community access to the walking trails, certainly, and um, certainly during construction, uh, lots of construction jobs and revenues to nearby businesses. And then ongoing and perpetuity, a significant um, tax benefit. This will 
require very, very little uh, public services, no school impacts, and will generate hundreds of thousands of dollars annually uh, to the town in terms of revenue. So we would like to thank you for uh, our, our ability to present the project and answer any questions you may have. Questions? Uh, we'll start at the end and work down. Councilor Rowan and then Councilor Foley. Yep. Um, so first question, um, and then I'll yield. Um, the, um, so when you mentioned 16 cottages, the idea would be the, the land that's reserved for future development, that's where you're thinking you might put an eight additional? Yeah, let me go backwards. So that would be, if it occurred, and we have no firm plan for it, if it occurred, it would most likely occur in this quadrant. Um, I've got to follow up a couple more. I yes. misspoke when I said I was going to yield right away. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll allow. <laughs> Uh, uh, so what would happen to the to the trails were, were you to uh, develop that or would it be in the contract that you'd maintain access and community trails as well yes yeah. if, if you if you notice that the most of the trails occur on the perimeter of the project and um, so if if the additional units were developed they would they would be in the center portion of the site the trails would remain on the periphery as well as the connection to the trail zone. Gotcha. I, I thought I saw one trail that went right through the middle. Yeah. Um, it, the there might be one or two segments that would need to be disturbed, but and then, generally as a whole, they would be retained. And then how many, um, how many bedrooms do each of the, the different building types have? Just out of curiosity, have you got uh, that far? They vary. It's, it's, um, would you like to Yeah, would you like to <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah. I, I know a little bit more about some of the details. Um, can I just clarify a point that was made? Uh, when we originally presented to you earlier this evening, um, I think it was said 16 cottage homes, that the number is actually eight. eight. So I just wanted to clarify that the number that we would seek to get permitted would be eight cottage homes. So just to clarify that. Uh, by and large, these apartments are going to be two-bedroom. Uh, there will be some that will be two-bedroom den. There may be one or two of the cottage homes that will be slightly larger. Um, but generally speaking, two-bedroom, two-bath would be the sort of the typical model in terms of number of bedrooms. We do think there may be um, a modest number of apartments in the hybrid building that may be like a one bedroom den style. Mm -hmm. Generally, we see the marketplace seeking more square footage rather than less. Mm -hmm. And that is really reflective of the design that, that we are sharing um, with you this evening. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. May I also just add another piece about right, community? Right. If I may add another piece about community benefit, I, I would like to note that in the proposed contract zoning amendment document, the trails are specifically addressed, that they would be maintained, that it would be accessible to the public at large. That is the case with the existing trails on, on the Piper Shores property. So we would like to extend that opportunity as part of this development. The other point that I would like to make with regard to community benefit is that in the contract zone uh, amendment that has been drafted, there is the affordable housing benefit that we would provide as part of this development to support affordable housing in the greater Scarborough, Scarborough community. So that is likewise an important part. Could you elaborate, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, um, we have uh, been talking to leadership uh, with the town and I think we have identified, um, and I can, can actually reference the document itself, but I believe it's a $2,000 per unit benefit? Yeah. It's two, we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> Times 50. 20, it's tw it's 20, 20, I'm sorry, 20. 20. Yeah. It's, right. it's 20, not two. It's, uh, but it's based on the It's, it's based upon 10 10%. units, so it's based a $20,000 right. allocation per every 10 units. Mm -hmm. So, and then it is brought down to a factor of, of I think it's two thousand dollars per unit. Yeah. So that's the yeah, easier way to look at it. Yeah. Yes, be a hundred thousand dollars to answer Councilor Rowan. That's question. correct. Thank you. That's correct. Thank you, Councilor Pony. Um, so, 
in that back section when you're talking about future development, if if and when it were to be developed, it would be another cottage style. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be any other type of building that you'd consider in that area? Uh, that's correct. We would anticipate that if that um, area were ever developed, and I will tell you because of the prevalence of wetlands, I don't think it's a strong likelihood, but it would certainly not be more than a, than a single story cottage style home. Okay. Um, and then uh, my second question is more related to the trails and the parking. Uh, one of the things I didn't realize this is just a first kind of pass at this. I'd be, uh, it would be important to me to know or have a commitment to you on, on the number of parking spots. If the drawing was accurate, there was only seven spots. Yes. There for, so I don't know if that's what you intend or not. And then uh, just one other point of clarification, it, it was very specific in saying walking trails. And my understanding is that that entire trail system that goes kind of to some other neighborhoods both in both directions is yes. used by a, a multi multitude of uses. Yes. Um, there that, are mountain bikers, there are, and so is it specifically just walking or would people be able to access to, to mountain bike there as well? Uh, we've identified it in general terms as walking trails, but the trails in their current condition are cut at about a width of six feet. So they would be available for walking, for cross-country skiing, for snowshoeing, et cetera. That's, I wanted to hear the restriction And it would be our that. intent to maintain the width at that okay. six-foot level, or width, um, for those various purposes. Thank you. Can you pick up on whether you've been in touch with the Scarborough Land Trust or uh, Camp Ketcha? Yes. As, uh, we referenced earlier in a presentation that we had reached out to the abutters of the property. We invited all of the abutters, including executive leadership of the land trust and of Camp Ketcha. Both were present at our abutters meeting on the, the 12th of June. Um, we actually held the event at Camp Ketcha, so that will reflect some degree of their support for this initiative. And we believe that likewise there is support from the land trust we believe that um, by offering this development and the use of the trails to the public at large, it will enhance access to both the Camp Catcher property as well as the Land Trust property that is to the rear of uh, Camp Catcher. So we really see it as opening up um, more than 100 acres of access to the public at large through the trail uh, development system. Yes. So I, I have quite a few questions, so I'm happy to defer if others have few. I have five questions, so if, <laughs> if there are others that have few, I'm, I'm happy to go last. Um, I Again, I talked um, with my counselors about this before, but just for the general public for notification, um, my cousin, James Bennett, is the treasurer of the board of directors of Piper Shores, so I just wanted to make that relationship known. I have absolutely no fiduciary interest. They're not getting any money or have any undue influence, but I just want to make that clear. And then I had just had one thing that popped in my little head. Because um, I do a lot of work with seniors in my own business, um, and I'm one myself. <laughs> um, I, it'd be interesting to see folks think about even doing some sort of disabled access to some of these trails. Uh, particularly where you have people with limiting conditions, physical conditions or eyesight conditions or whatever in your own facility, it would just be kind of a fun thing to think about too. Just something I'm going to throw out there. Councilor Kazo. Did you have anything? Okay. Um, so thanks for showing up. I appreciate that. Uh, Thank you. First question I have is, um, do you know the age of the structure of Five Dorado? It's approximately 19 years old. Okay, so it's a relatively newer facility. It's not, relatively no new, yes. There is no historical significance to that property. There is not. Way. Okay. Um, I, I'm curious to know if you've considered the traffic across Spurwink between the two facilities and how you expect to mitigate that? Yes. Um, we will be providing uh, a Piper Shore sponsored transportation back and forth between the two communities to try to in part limit the amount of automobile traffic back and forth. Um, we expect that this community will support approximately 80 residents. Um, 
Some will use the pipe, the existing Piper Shores community. Others will, will frankly not, based upon my experience in working with communities that have separate addresses. Um, I do not anticipate any significant increase in traffic. We would certainly be willing to do some further evaluation to the satisfaction of both the Planning Board and Town Council with regard to traffic. I would point out that right now there are about 360 residents on the existing Piper Shores campus with the addition of 80 residents to this community. This will not be a staff intensive community. In other words, there will be no health services. There will be no 24 hour around the clock staffing that will be provided on this campus. Therefore, there will be a de minimis number of staff that are actually accessing the property. Okay. Um, wetland mitigation, obviously looking at your development map and the overlay, how do you expect to deal yes. with that mitigation? Um, as uh, Mr. Conway had indicated, we had had a very good informal session with a, uh, a DEP officer. In the original plan that was presented, it looked as though we were slightly above one acre of impact on wetlands. We went back and revised the plan. We actually reduced the number of uh, single family cottages from 11 to 8 in order to preserve more of the existing wetlands. We believe we're somewhere in the area of impacting between 0.7 and 0.8 acres through this development process. If there are opportunities to mitigate even further, we would like to do that for obvious reasons, environmental reasons, excuse me, as well as cost reasons. So we have worked very hard in terms of the placement of the housing accommodations to try to mitigate any impact. Uh, affordable housing, I, I noticed you mentioned we, you, you referenced our kind of standard. Yes. Uh, how, uh, how much of an impact is that on this project moving forward? Um, the impact really would be a payment in lieu of actually developing that housing on this property, in large part because the Piper Shores model is housing that is developed for seniors as part of a life care program. Now, what happens is the life care program includes an entrance fee and a monthly fee, and then the organization supports the health care costs of that resident over the course of his or her lifetime. So there is an insurance component to the pricing of these homes. Therefore, they would not be able to be priced at an affordable housing level and have us offer the commensurate amount of benefit that a life care model um, suggests. Therefore, that's why we would prefer to be able to make a payment in lieu of actually developing that housing on the site. I, I guess I would, I would put my, my two cents in. I think that's, that's an approach we've taken in the past. I think the value of that offset is something that needs to be determined, um, not just on a per unit basis, but I think the valuation and the value of the property and the amount of property that we would be losing for potential development should be part of that consideration as well. So, um, so I guess the last question I have is, uh, why do you want to extend the contract zone? Why not go for uh, an existing zoning structure that's out there that will meet your needs? Uh, as we consider the existing contract zone and the prospect of developing a, a new contract zone, we're essentially providing the same kinds of services. We're literally right across the street from our existing 138-acre campus. The requirements that are part of the contract zone we imagine would be generally consistent with the existing agreement and just felt that it would be a more streamlined process in order to extend by way of an amendment the existing contract zone. So if I could follow, so if a contract zone is not available uh, and you need that, that zoning to be more standard or, or some standard zone that we have that would accommodate your facility, would that impact your, your desire to move forward? Uh, we would not move forward if we had to pursue uh, the two acre minimum mm -hmm. lots that this, pro that this property currently is zoned for. Uh, the project is, is simply not feasible at that level. 
are there other contracts? Are there under, other zones available to you aside from a contract zone that would give you the density requirements that you're looking for? I'm not aware of any, but I would defer to um, others who are more attuned to the contract zone and the zoning designations. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the answer to that today. Perhaps, Will, you can address. Uh, the answer is uh, yes, and I'm kind of looking at the planning director who maybe mm -hmm. can weigh in on this. But I think the issue with that is this is in a, a large area of the town that's zoned RF, and to look for zoning for this property that's different, then that is probably may not be looked upon favorably. But Jay, maybe you could weigh in. Certainly, if you if you wish to, Mr. Chase. Happy to try to answer questions as I can, but I, I think uh, Mr. Conway did a pretty good job in answering. I I frankly haven't looked to see what of our zoning um, uh, existing zones might allow this density. I'm fairly confident that we have zones that would allow 68 units on how many acres are we talking? 45. 45 acres. We certainly have zones that would allow that type of density. But I think uh, Mr. Conway is right. Uh, it, it, the reason we have contract zoning is um, ostensibly uh, to enable projects that don't sort of fit the general character of a neighborhood, provided the applicant can sort of meet the council's threshold. Um, otherwise, we'd really be looking at creating what's called the spot zone, um, mm -hmm. doing spot zoning, where this whole area is really RF zoning. Uh, other, the, the closest, next closest zoning is the Higgins Beach zoning, which is, isn't all that far, but it's certainly a very different context. Um, so, um, I don't know if that, you know, addressed your question specifically, but I would say, I guess what I'd say in summary, I, certainly we have zones that could allow this type of density. I think contract zone is written into our ordinance for this type of development, um, and it probably is the best approach. So the reason, I guess, well, I'll clarify, the reason for my question is uh, I, I'm, I really don't like contract zones. Every time there's an amendment or a change, it has to come before the council, and it's a little cumbersome. Uh, if there's something there that, that fits, that works through the regular process, I, I don't know if, that, if that's something that, that the project won't allow, um, so be it. But I, I, contract zones to me are something I'd like to be moving away from rather than moving towards, and we seem to be expanding them on a regular basis. So that's my, my two cents. Other questions? Councilor Rose? <coughs> this, this might be more of a question for um, uh, Jay, but. Um, do we have the infrastructure down there to support this kind of density? I mean, it's it's RF zone. I mean, do we have sewer, water? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's public sewer and public water. Okay. I know you said it was for me, but I might actually defer to their engineer who's probably looked at oh, this sure. more closely than I have, but uh, sewer and water does run down Spurwick and sort of, um, connect to the existing facilities. But, um, he has any I don't. We've, we've looked at it, Great. and uh, there is adequate capacity. Thank you. Uh, Jim, I, uh, uh, I notice there's a request for an extended roadway. Uh, do you have uh, an intention to spl sprinkler the, the buildings or provide protections against uh, a longer dead-end street? Yes, the, the project would include um, fully sprinklered structures. The existing Piper Shores uh, community, all of the structures are fully sprinklered. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, we'll uh, ask the public, anyone wishing to address this uh, matter, uh, please present yourself at the podium. State your name and address. I accept the motion. So moved. Second. <clears throat> moved and seconded. Uh, this is a first reading uh, uh, discussion. Councilor Rowley. Yeah, uh, so I think for a first read, I'm, I'm happy to have it move, move forward. Um, I think I'd like to echo, uh, pick up on uh, something Councilor Chiazza said regarding the and Luffy. I think that, um, that it may not be um, enough uh, in general, uh, to, to say that one uh, affordable unit, um, uh, you can buy your way out of one affordable unit for $20,000. Uh, 
Um, I think the build out cost is significantly higher. Um, and uh, uh, I think I'd also like to, to advocate that, that in a contract zone, we don't have to allow an in Luffy. Um, we, we, I'd like to at least have us talk about having, uh, requiring the build out. I understand that their, their business model is different, um, but perhaps they don't have the same level of, of um, uh, the, the, the same level of insurance or lifetime care commitment uh, from that perspective. But I, I do think that for com from a community benefit standard, I, I don't know that um, $100,000 is sufficient for, for affordable housing. Um, the, um, you know, there's such a dearth of affordable senior housing in the state, in the area, in town, uh, that I'd, I'd really like to have that explored um, during further discussion. But for, for today, I'm happy with it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm first read, I'm happy to, to see it go forward, but I, I agree with everything that uh, Councillor Rowan just said. And then also just a little concerned about if, if the intent is only seven parking spots for, <laughs> that's not a lot of uh, public access in a town as large as we are. And I could imagine um, it being quite popular to be able to go and access the trails with this. I'd like to see a little more parking there than that. So that would be something I would ask them to consider. Thank you. Also, Katarina. Uh, yeah, I would vote to move this forward also subject to, you know, further review. It will go to planning board and whatever. Um, but I agree, uh, to me, affordable housing is a huge issue here in town, and I would like to see us have more discussions with that as part of the community good because, like, Councilor Cayazzo, I don't like contract zone um, for many reasons. So I want to make sure that uh, we are addressing that, and if you want to call it a quid pro quo, uh, there it is. But um, yeah, I'd like to have some more discussions around that. Thank you, Councilor Hayes. No, I, I uh, will support it going forward on first read. I kind of echo all the comments that have been shared and agree with them. Further conversations will be important. Yeah, thank you, Councilor Hayes. Yeah, so I think I've expressed my concerns, but I'd like that to be um, relayed to the planning board. I'd like to see them look at the traffic. I'd like to see them look at wetland mitigation because I'm not convinced that that's adequate looking at the plans uh, and looking at the amount of development for what's there. Uh, and the affordable housing piece is obviously key to me. I will move it forward for first reading, um, but uh, I'd like to see a lot more detail uh, and certainly feedback from the planning board on those issues as well. Thank you. I uh, attended the uh, public hearing for the neighborhood uh, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, meeting went well. Uh, uh, most of the people from the neighborhood were from the Acorn Street uh, area, and uh, some of whom I know. And uh, uh, so I was encouraged that uh, the two uh, subdivisions that run uh, astride this proposed development seem to be on board uh, with it. And I think that's very important because we are. Uh, uh, placing uh, a higher density than the current zoning allows. Uh, seeing no further discussion, uh, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. And thank you for the presentation and, and answering all our questions. Order 18-46, act on the request to certify the result of the school budget validation that was held on Tuesday, June 12, 2018, and ask the town manager to introduce this matter. Yes, this is a customary matter for the council to certify the election results. Um, there were a number of, uh, I suppose, questions or inquiries that um, I received. I actually met with a group of residents uh, regarding their experiences or at least some things they heard about the election. And I would like to just take a moment hopefully for the benefit of the council, but also the public as well, just to provide a couple comments in that regard. Uh, just to put things in context, with regard to the school validation vote, uh, we've been doing this since 2008, and this past June 12th was the fourth time during that period 
that we've had a vote margin within 100 votes, uh, just using that as a benchmark. Uh, people seem to think that, that margin was close enough that we should uh, perhaps consider doing a recount. Uh, in two of those cases, uh, it was defeated. In, in two cases, uh, the, the budget actually uh, passed by that narrow margin. One uh, was as close as 10 votes. And I would just point out that in none of those cases was a recount ever considered, to my knowledge. Um, I wasn't here for uh, the first one in 2008. Uh, and certainly, they, they were never undertaken. Um, if we thought at all that there were any irregularities with the process and the results, we would certainly be the ones to be the uh, to initiate uh, any process required to get to the bottom of that. And I think our past um, examples uh, really are the best uh, example of that. We've had a number of very noteworthy cases where we've had some questionable um, um, results, and each and every time we have, I think, done the right thing. I know we've done the right thing by uh, taking the time to uh, state our mistakes, to take our time to clarify and to correct those results. And we would certainly be inclined to do that here again. The two uh, things in specific that I've heard that I'd like to address are that uh, uh, voters were received multiple ballots. Uh, this year there was a single uh, local ballot that contained the school budget re uh, referendum question only. Uh, voters should have received only one of those, and then there were two state ballots this year. Uh, we were aware on at least two occasions that did occur. Um, we do have election workers. Uh, I would characterize it as human error. In the two occasions we're aware of, those voters returned those extra ballots, as they should. Uh, I suppose um, in the event it could have happened again that we're not aware of, uh, I guess there's two points I would uh, note. The voter would have filled out that ballot incorrectly and potentially committed election mm -hmm. fraud. But more importantly, uh, we do have election monitors at each of the machines. And I think it would have been certainly highly irregular and I expect would have been caught by the monitor if there was a voter um, looking to feed in more than one ballot in that machine that was dedicated to school. So uh, from my estimation and, and that of uh, the election uh, folks as well, uh, that would certainly be highly unlikely for that to occur. And in the event of recur, uh, recount, frankly, that ballot would have been counted again. So we really would not have gotten to the bottom of any of that. And the other piece, which was uh, an occurrence that I've heard uh, was fairly common statewide, uh, these voting machines can be fickle at times. They're optical scanning devices. Mm -hmm. um, in our instance, we did have uh, a point midday on election day where one of the devices dedicated to the school ballots uh, did have some reading issues, and what happens in, it, in that instance, it simply won't receive the ballot. You can try and try. And uh, the election workers kind of uh, worked on that to clean some debris of dust away, and during that period, they wanted to make sure that things flowed. And so on the front of each of the uh, election machines, there is a slot uh, for the voter to simply deposit their ballot, and it's then called an auxiliary ballot. And uh, in fact, there were 150 auxiliary ballots uh, at the end of election day. And I know for a fact they were counted because I left here with one vote total and I got halfway home and Tony called to say, um, let me correct that, um, you, you know, we need to include these additional 150 auxiliary ballots. So we know for certain that they were counted that evening. And so I just want to really give voters the assurance that um, we have safeguards in place. Um, we followed them, and we have certainly no reason to believe that there's a need for a recount. And I hope members of council agree with that uh, assessment. Um, there was nothing irregular or unexpected, and uh, the election staff and I have full faith and confidence in the results, and hope you do too. Thank you. Uh, public comment on the uh, order. Seeing none, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Councilor Rowan. Yeah, can I just ask a question? The the uh, uh, the number of rank choice voting ballots returned versus the number of um, uh, school budget ballots uh, returned. Did, were they fairly close? I mean, that that would be kind of the, well, the benchmark I would see. Where as an independent voter, you would get one of each, and everybody would get one of these. Well, if you're independent, if you're unenrolled. Know, you would only you. get two. You'd get the state referendum and the school budget referendum. In order to get the primary, you'd have to register in the party. 
Do you, do you happen so, to know the, the number returned? So the referendum for received, they returned back 5,920, and ours was 5,915. Some people didn't return ballots. Yeah. And they, actually, the combination between the Dems and the uh, Republicans was 4,608. So we had more people vote on the refer two referendum questions than we did on the prior one. Thank you. Chris. Yeah, so uh, I, I had the fortunate or unfortunate privilege to be at the polls the entire day, and I, I <laughs> fully acknowledge that there was some frustration uh, amongst uh, some citizens with the amount of time uh, and the delays. Uh, I think, to me, that's a positive thing because uh, that means that we weren't rushing through things and, and, and things were, were um, thoroughly uh, processed. Um, I, I, I will say, you know, I think perhaps some of this um, um, Concern is is an or is the fact that a lot of citizens aren't aware of the checks and balances that exist behind the process. They're they're open and transparent, but you may not see those when you're at the polling station. So there's multiple ways to confirm or identify errors that happen, and and I think to uh, the the town clerk's um, uh, benefit, we have identified those as Tom has mentioned in the past. So I think we've gone through the same balance, same processes, the same checks and balances. I think if there were any um, uh, irregularities we would have been identified, that would have been identified, we would have been notified, and we would have taken the cor best corrective actions forward. So hopefully that explanation that, that uh, Tom gave was uh, sufficient to alleviate citizens' concerns about the integrity of the voting process. I do believe um, that it is very sound and very thorough, uh, and I think there are, are, are multiple uh, checks and balances that we go through to confirm that. And if you recall, we actually had a an ad hoc uh, council committee last year review that process specifically in light of some of the irregularities that we had identified in the past, not that had gotten through. So I think the, the results of that, that review and that process confirmed what we all know and that it's a very sound process, it's a very thorough process, and it's a, uh, a very um, robust process. And as a side note, I would like to um, congratulate Chairman Donovan, who has the dubious distinction, I guess, of being the only council chair to have every budget pass under his guidance, uh, I think in the history of Scarborough. So con congratulations to, to, to that. Thank you. <laughs> it's, what, we're going to do some it, research on that. I, look, it up, that yeah. look it up. Look it up. What are the obvious coincidences of life? <laughs> <laughs> Take the credit where you can. Also, <laughs> uh, Yeah, having formally worked in a number of elections and been the deputy election warden, um, I, I would just, re, I don't want to rehash, but yeah, there are a lot of built-in uh, checks and balances in the system that the average person is not, is not aware of, but um, rest assured that uh, everything was done, was done correctly, the auditing afterwards and whatever showed that there weren't nothing out of line, so it's just a very close vote, I mean, and that happens. Um, it's not close enough, though, for a recount. I know that sounds really strange, but the first election I ever ran in, and I lost by like 115 votes, and I thought, oh my God, they should recount, and then I realized, uh-uh. <laughs> when, when you have machine counts, it's gonna come out pretty much the same. There's not gonna be much much difference when you're counting originally with by, by machines. But I did wanna thank the election staff, you know, for all the work that they do, because it's not just election day, it's all of the uh, work prior to processing absentees and, and whatever. So, you know, thank you for that. And uh, we did meet one of our council goals, in case anyone missed it. Or our, I think our primary council goal was to pass the budget on the first yeah. vote. So congratulations to everybody on that one. Councilor Foley. Um, yeah, I, I guess my only comment would be, you know, it's. Clearly, we can all understand and appreciate, you know, emotions have been running high for quite some time in town, and I think that adds to uh, perhaps the questioning that we're hearing. But I want to just say, if on my, you know, personal view, I have absolutely full confidence in Tody and her team um, for all the reasons that many of my fellow counselors here have stated. Um, you know, would we, you know, we didn't hit the, the parameter that's needed for a recount, and so I support. Uh, the decision not to do that. Um, I would just encourage all of us to think about 
as leaders, though, how do we get to a place where those kinds of questions don't keep coming up? And um, so that's a personal challenge I'm going to pose to myself and to us as a group, because um, that, that actually concerns me more than anything else. Um, that's, a, that's something that I'd like to, uh, in this next year, see if we can tackle. So, I, but I, to anyone out there, I fully support, um, you know, our process checks and balances that have been put in place, and uh, I have no doubt that the, the vote was accurately forecast. Thank you. Councilor Owen. Yeah, can I ask a question? I, um, um, do we have a threshold at, under, at which we would trigger a, a recount? Yeah. No, I'm not aware that there's an automatic threshold. It's, it's typically initiated, uh, initiated by, by the, the voters, and more often than not by a candidate. <coughs> But there's no threshold that I'm aware of. There is some confusion around that. The law does talk about a 1.5% margin. That is in the context of whether a deposit is required uh, for a recount. But I'm not aware that there's any automatic threshold. Turner, thank you. Yeah, and I would expect that uh, with a 10 vote differential in one of these and no recall, no recount was required, that that pretty well establishes it. <clears throat> Other discussion on the matter? Ready to vote? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, non action items, none. Uh, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Let's, Chris, let's start down there with you. I have nothing to report. Peter? Yeah, a couple things. Um, the Finance Committee did meet on June 19th of this week. And there were kind of three things we did discuss. One, we did go over the March 31st financial statements, and actually I included to everybody this morning just sort of the executive summary of that. Um, I did what, there's, there's two pieces of information that we did here um, in the Finance Committee. One is, Tom, maybe you need to correct me if I speak out of turn. Um, I think we did receive some, some positive news that we are actually tracking a little better than we thought this year as far as revenues and expenditures go, that we actually may end up in a better place at the end of the year than we had budgeted, which is good news. There are some revenues that were higher than we had forecasted and anticipated, and there's been some pretty good controls on a lot of expense items. There are some expense items like salt, which was a rough rough year for us. Um, but what I did distribute to you, I, I thought it was important maybe just for the other council members and also for the audience. This year, as everybody knows, we did do um, we did do a bond for the public safety building. And it was it was it was kind of an education for us, the finance committee. Um, when we issue bonds, sometimes you're required to get a bond premium back. You actually pay a slightly higher interest rate, but you get cash back. We actually got about $1.3 million in bond premium back, and we're required that we have to use it, something to do with the debt service. So I, I just, it, it's in the last paragraph of what we distributed. Um, we used about 90,000 of that to pay for the bond issuance itself. Um, we're going to apply 515,000 of it to, to a, bond pre, a bond payment that's due, interest payment that's due this fall. Tom, is that correct? Correct. Interest only, but yes. And then there's about $735,000 that we actually apply to buy down the, the amount of money we need to borrow for the public safety bill. And so those are pretty significant numbers. I, I, that's why I distributed this to everybody so you sort of knew it. Anybody in the audience that has questions, certainly give us a call. Um, so that was the financial statements. Um, the other thing we did, we've been working for over a year, Chris, something like that. More than that. <laughs> um, we will bring you forth on the next meeting. We've been working on sort of a combined financial and physical policy. Fiscal policy. I don't know how many pages it was. It turned out to be 30 so. plus pages. We've embedded some metrics in it. We've embedded a lot of things. We've tried to make it simpler. We'll be bringing that forward and kind of that with our recommendations for review. And then the third thing we talked about, we didn't get very far, but it's still, we have talked about it as I think the, the last three finance committees, really trying to get to a place where we can start thinking about financial modeling again. In particular, we thought it was really important as we start thinking about debt service. One of our goals is how can we keep our debt payments level? And we know that we, we're approaching some major projects down, down the highway. There's the community center we've talked about. There's the library expansion. There's maybe a likelihood we're going to have to do something around some of the schools and primary schools. 
So we really want to start thinking about if we can do some financial modeling so we can start looking a little bit ahead. And town staff agreed that they would at least bring back something to us to start that conversation. And Tom, if I put words in your mouth, let me know. But I think in the past, because of you know the funding for schools being volatile and other things, but I think you echoed saying you, you think we're in a more stable place from a revenue point of view, yeah, being right. able to project. Yeah, I think some of those um, uncertain variables are, are, we're through that phase. So I think we're in a better place to be able to project forward, looking forward. And, and I know some of our constituents have been asking for some of that financial modeling. So those are the, <coughs> sort of the three things that we had discussed at the finance committee meeting. Then quickly to report back on the Coastal Harbor and Shellfish. They're back up and running. They have a full <laughs> slate of officers. Um, they do have some things in front of them. Um, just for Councilor Catalina, the Coastal will take up the moorings Good. issue Great. that we talked about. Thank you. I'm not sure they were happy about that. Oh, <laughs> <but yeah. laughs> it, is, it is on their docket. All right. Um, and I just want to report out for the Shellfish Commission, they're still having conversations about surveys so they can get to a point where they have some criteria for licensing, which is what we've asked for for the last year. The other thing I wanted to share is on the surveys, there was a lot of questions about how to do that. The University of New England has a student that's been coming to every meeting. He's actually going to conduct several different types of surveys on the class and try to see what works. So we're actually getting some, some science we can apply to what we're doing. So I thought those are all positive things. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it on. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Gettering. Yeah, uh, last week uh, communications met, um, worked on our action plan and adopted it. And I will be, I will present it probably the next meeting in July. I'll, I'll bring something forward. Um, and we 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 went over, you know, the things that have been talked about in pr last year. I guess was the first year of the communications committee, and we we have managed to hit a few of the um, uh, goals, like. The, the budget forms, it was felt that those were very helpful and we should continue those. Facebook email, uh, Larissa is doing a great job with those things. The Memorial Day Parade, uh, we got a lot of very positive feedback for participating in that. So, you know, we'd like to see that continue as an annual mm -hmm. event for folks who are able to, to do that. Because it's not just the parade, it's also the uh, memorial service that's at Veterans Hall. Uh, and people were very impressed that the town council actually showed up. And the council table at elections is also very popular. I was, things were just disappearing off the table and I had great questions and lots of folks chatting with me. So that was that. Tomorrow at 4.30 is the ordinance and we're gonna be talking about two hot topics. One is signs. We're gonna discuss, you know, what What's happened in the past year? Is there anything more we need to do? Whatever. More general discussion. And also marijuana. <laughs> Since the state passed the marijuana uh, mm -hmm. provisions, we're going to talk about you know, what, if anything, we want to do as a town. So that's tomorrow at 4.30 if anyone's interested here at Town Hall. Thank you. Councilor Foley. Uh, Council Katarina Covered Communications Conservation Commission also met um, and I will be uh, calling each of you individually to kind of chat with you about plastic bags and uh, <laughs> your uh, kind of thoughts on whether that's a, a, something we should pursue or not here in Scarborough um, and give that feedback to the back to the Commission Very next good. month. Uh, and they also, they conducted some exit polling um, as well at the election. I haven't seen the results of that yet, um, but they're really trying to just gauge whether or not, you know, towns folks have uh, some appetite for developing some kind of a climate action plan. Mm -hmm. So um, that's work that continues there. And that is it for me. Great. Councilor Rowan. Uh, I have nothing tonight. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> Metro Regional Coalition met <clears throat> last week. <clears throat> Tom and I attended. Uh, we met with some uh, Boston area officials, the uh, mayor of uh, Somerville, uh, mm -hmm. been the mayor for the last 15 years, young man, must have been made mayor at, at his youth because he's <laughs> obviously still a young man, but uh, very capable and uh, uh, he is the chair of the Mayor's Coalition, which is the 15 communities that make up uh, the greater inner greater Boston area. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, and we talked about uh, their experiences uh, on uh, housing, affordable housing, 
uh, they, uh, they strain to a much greater degree than we do on those issues. They're, they need tens of thousands, I think, of 400,000 units of housing. Of, of new housing uh, uh, to meet the demand, uh, the greater Boston area growth. And they candidly admitted that there's a NIMBYism problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we continue to look at the homelessness issue, and we as a council, I hope, will keep an open mind as the Metro Regional Coalition uh, uses this summer to try to uh, develop a, a clearer plan as to what to propose to the seven towns that make up the Metro Regional Coalition. I've been pushing uh, an active participation of the county mm -hmm. uh, because the county is made up of uh, all of Cumberland counties, Jim Gailey, uh, 26, I think 26 towns, uh, and it broadens the participation of uh, if we're trying to uh, devise strategies that would address homelessness, every town com uh, contributes to some degree or another. <clears throat> and they all end up in Portland uh, <clears throat> in, this, in, our, in our area, uh, for the most part. Uh, and uh, a third of them come from out of state. Mm -hmm. So they're not Portlanders. And a third of them come from uh, the towns that surround. So, there is an obligation for all of us to participate uh, in that. We'll work on that. And obviously, the Housing First program uh, is something that we'll, I'd ask you to, to come to understand a little bit better um, uh, because that probably will be one of the cornerstones that uh, is pushed. Uh, I, I actually would like to get a, uh, an opportunity for all of us to see one of the Housing First uh, facilities. <coughs> uh, I saw the Huston Commons mm -hmm. off, off of uh, mm, blanking on uh, the street in uh, Portland. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it was the best building in the, in the street by a mile. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, a very welcoming, et cetera. So that is it for committees. Mm -hmm. Uh, town manager's report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, couple points of interest. Uh, the FEMA did file with the, in the Federal Register this past week a uh, revised flood map. So here we go again. This will be at least the third time um, over, I think, a six-year period. So uh, what that really does is it initiates the process. Uh, there's a comment period that runs 90 days that will expire September 17th. And uh, so we'll keep you updated as we, as we move forward. As regards the public safety building, there's kind of three quick updates. Uh, we've received what I'll characterize as positive news from DEP. They've begun their, uh, their review and have provided generally very positive comments, but it's still underway. That leaves us with some optimism that that uh, September 1 start date is still uh, within reach. Uh, as I mentioned, I think at the last meeting, by the end of this month, we'll have a guaranteed maximum price for the site work, which is a big question mark to us at this point. So, uh, and then by the end of July, we'll actually have a guaranteed maximum price on the entire building. So things are really moving forward quickly at this point. Uh, we've also decided to pull out the communications tower as part of a, a so it's not part of the overall project. We're, do, we're bidding it on our own. It's gonna require obviously coordination with, uh, with, with all the other consultants. Uh, we did have one bid received, and it's well within budget, so we feel good about that. We're going to certainly verify that it's a qualified contractor and that we should be moving forward. Um, with Larissa's assistance, we are moving forward with the sale of five formerly tax-acquired properties. Some of you may recall I came to this council back actually in late 2015 mm -hmm. and received uh, authorization to move forward. Um, we started that and then stopped it, but this time we are moving forward. I mention that because it's really kind of irregular for us to be selling property. Um, we're going through our conventional process, but we're also trying to reach out to local brokers to make them aware. Mm -hmm. And uh, any sales obviously are approved by council, and we reserve any, the right to reject or accept any of them. So we'll have some more information uh, perhaps as soon as your next meeting. Uh, we had previously scheduled a <coughs> workshop on the Pine Point Co-op, and I mentioned that in passing, uh, there's still a, an interested, well, certainly the current owners are interested in selling, so that much is, is true. 
Um, it remains to be seen whether there's uh, the person that we've been chatting with will ultimately um, be the, the purchaser, but I, I think it's fair to say that someone will be uh, in front of us. And I mention that because uh, probably unbeknownst to all councilors and most of the public, uh, the, the town has uh, ongoing interest in that property. We have a number of deed restrictions that, um, not the least of which requires consent of any sale, but there's some other particulars as well. So that's an issue that I think I can predict will be in front of council sometime in the, probably sooner than later, and uh, we'll certainly update you. Um, with respect to the reval, the commercial industrial reval is within a week of being completed for field work. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are completing the vision conversion, and what's important about that is that all that new data from the field work uh, will be put into the new system, and that's what will produce the new value. So um, as I get more information, I'll certainly share that with you, but we're right on schedule, certainly, to make, uh, make that conversion in time for the commitment. And then on the residential reval, in anticipation of uh, the approval of the budget, or actually the passage of the town budget, we did get out and issue an RFP. We have two very qualified bids, the ones we expected and hoped for. Uh, the real good news is one of them was $75,000 lower than our budget estimate. So um, barring anything shocking to us, uh, I think we'll be coming in very good shape. We'll be doing interviews with both firms on June 26th. Uh, so we're anxious to get that underway. Uh, we've been told that either firm will really need the full 12 months to be able to do this. So. The sooner we get this awarded and them started, um, I think the better for all of us. And lastly, the summer concert series starts uh, next Thursday, the 20, excuse me, a week from Thursday, the 28th, and will continue every Thursday thereafter uh, until August 2. And so that's a free family friendly event here in Memorial Park. Uh, again, every Thursday evening at 6.30 in the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll add to uh, town manager's uh, comments, the public safety building roadway had been a bit of an issue and every effort has been made now to move it as far away from Memorial Park, including away from the uh, uh, sidewalk that goes around the perimeter <clears throat> and as close to the car wash as humanly possible. Uh, so that is, I thought, a, a good initiative that uh, yeah. has been advanced. Um, Councillor member comments. Councillor Nothing tonight, thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Foley. Uh, I would just remind everybody that school is now out for summer, which means a lot of little ones uh, are riding bikes and playing in places that they wouldn't normally be seen, so be extra careful on the roads. Thank and you. have a great summer. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gary. Uh, nothing other than to congratulate <coughs> the uh, graduates of uh, the class of 2018, whether you went to Scarborough High School or any of the other schools around. Good for you, and uh, good luck with your future endeavors. Thank you, Councilor Hayes. Nothing this evening. Thank you. Have a great Councilor summer. Councilor um, I, I, I won't <coughs> steal the, uh, the chair's thunder other than to say we were at the, uh, the groundbreaking this, uh, this afternoon for uh, <coughs> Gateway, so I, I'm assuming you're going to reference that in your comments, so I have no comments. Great. Uh, <clears throat> we had a good town turnout for the groundbreaking of uh, the, the beacon at Gateway. This is the project that was approved this past year uh, for 288 units of high quality uh, apartment buildings uh, right next door to uh, golf and ski. Uh, we were out there, Tom, myself, Jay Chase, uh, Chris, uh, Karen Martin, uh, we really enjoyed it, had the opportunity to talk with uh, the developers and the staff. <clears throat> the rental occupancy is uh, intended to start this October 1st, mm -hmm. so only a few months away uh, from being ready to have their clubhouse and their first building ready for occupancy. It's really moving along rapidly. Uh, they plan to finish the project by next summer or fall at the latest, but probably in the summer. To date, they have paid us over $1.1 million uh, in fees, uh, a really incredible amount, of which $583,000 
has been uh, uh, put in our affordable housing uh, uh, project. So that that's ter terrific. Uh, I really wanted to thank, uh, offer thanks to the school board and the administration for the excellent budget uh, that was approved by the voters. Uh, I wanted to thank the finance committee and the town council for uh, the excellent budget that the municipality submitted and the town manager was instrumental in submitting that. I was very pleased with the way that was presented. <clears throat> and I want to thank all of those people who voted for the school budget. <clears throat> it faced some difficult headwinds with the recent events that we're all too sadly familiar with, the recall, the uh, slanderous attacks on the superintendent, some of the uh, social media commentary, uh, and again, uh, the, uh, the sign campaign. I had uh, an interesting experience a couple of hours ago. I was, every Wednesday, I play in the Nonsuch Men's League. And I played today with a guy named Mike, who I didn't know, who was from Scarborough. And he asked me the question, so, well, what's the taxes, taxes gonna look like? And I said, I think it's a good story. I'm guessing about 1%. He said, 1%? <laughs> are you kidding me? I said, what, what are all these 5.6% signs out there? And I said, well, what did you think that was saying? He said, I thought that was saying what was obviously being said. That was what the tax rate increase was. Hmm. And I said, well, there's a tiny little print associated <laughs> with that. And if you've got an abacus, you might be able to find that number. But uh, that, uh, that was just a Scarborough resident who said, this is, and then he said, and those signs are out there by that tax group, right? He, he got it, he knew uh, who was putting them out there. He called them out and I didn't, I was very circumspect in my remarks about it because I wanted to hear what a citizen of Scarborough had to say about these circumstances. Uh, and I never met this guy before, although he said we did play two years ago in the same league, <laughs> but I didn't remember him. But I just, I, I thought that was, uh, that was important, and, uh, and uh, kudos to the town of Scarborough for voting for this budget, because it was a heck of a good budget. Uh, uh, lastly, uh, I wouldn't normally comment on national events. It's not our place, but I must say, God help us if we believe that intentionally hurting children is an acceptable means of enforcing our immigration law. or leveraging other goals that s some official may want to advance. So, so I'll accept the motion. So moved. Sure. All in favor, thank you. Just a, a reminder, we are entering summer schedule, so uh, your meeting next month will be July 18th. Mm -hmm.